In the past decade, a number of anomalies have occurred and are continuing to occur on Earth and in our solar system. They are not man-made, although we are contributing to an exacerbation of their effects on Earth's climate. The connection between electromagnetism and the weather can be explored through the electric universe theory, our star water theory, or maybe some of the newly discovered magnetic portals in the interplanetary magnetic field connecting us all. Essentially, this natural event is electromagnetic and our weather's telling the tale. Our records are falling and I imagine most of you need no primer on our wacky weather. Well, we should see these effects on other planets as well. Jupiter has a new storm, Red Junior. Then, it lost an entire layer of cloud stripes. A brand new superstorm appeared on Saturn, too. For these storms to persist so long, the source of their difference potential must be static, like planetary footprints or magnetic connections to the sun, moons, and each other. This shows one of those, Enceladus' footprint on Saturn in UV spectrum. It can involve resonant frequencies between them as well, like the Aero storm on Titan. By the way, we have new radio emissions coming from Jupiter's plasma toroid. Saturn's rotation is slowing down, along with that of Venus. We recently observed auroras on Uranus for the first time. Just days ago, we saw Jupiter discharge electrically. And it was said to be an asteroid impact, but there is no visible hole blown through the outer gases like we've seen before. There is no debris, which would have been evident if it broke apart before hitting the gas. The concentric circles remind you of anything you see on radar these days? On a more macro scale, we have the ENA ribbon. It is powerful enough to be turning the solar wind back around into the inner system. It is perpendicularly oriented to the galactic magnetic field. The latest solar minimum showed signs of oddity first in 2007 when normal polar coronal holes began uncharacteristically migrating to lower latitudes. By April of 2009, the solar minimum had established itself as a significant event among observed history. 2008 showed uncommonly low solar activity. Then, to NASA's dismay, it dropped even further in 2009, testing the records broken only a year before, officially the longest minimum since 1913, but it kept going. August of that year had a sunspot number of 0, 0.0. All of 2010 was quiet, and it was not until March of 2011 that we woke up. Since then, we have escalated variably with our first peak in November. You can see here is a good visualization on the left is last solar cycle, which was very typical, highly reliable as a model until now. You can see just how much longer the minimum lasted this time comparatively. Two important points. First, they expect slight atmospheric collapse during solar minimum. Of course, they try to pin the recent freefall on CO2 or methane. Second, Solar flares, which are more common at solar maximum, expand the atmosphere back out. So keep in mind what this extra long minimum would mean considering those two facts. And also consider this. In 2003, NASA released this article and graphic about our shifting North Pole. Coming in, we see that the first change was noticed over a 70 year period here. But in about 70 more years, it had moved substantially further. And it took another large jump, but did so in less than 30 years. This was around the time that the BBC reported that Earth's fading magnetic shield was not news to most scientists. When it hit National Geographic in 2004, the cat was out of the bag. We have since learned that the pole is moving faster and the magnetic field fades by day, much more quickly than expected. With weak points and holes appearing as our North Pole races toward Russia at a staggering 40 miles per year, at least when they last checked. In the last 18 months, records have fallen for tornadoes, flooding, drought, tropical storms, heat, cold, noctilucent clouds, and more. And then there's the critical frequencies in the F1 layer. Now, the critical frequencies set the radio frequency required for wave propagation in the atmosphere, but they indirectly indicate the ambient energy in those electric sheets. This is us, juiced up from last solar maximum, then coming back down during that long solar minimum, and beginning to show an electromagnetic surplus anomaly that coincides with our collapsing atmosphere and weakening magnetic shield. Even if they never make this data public again, we know the score. 
We know that a return to a solar maximum is upon us, and with it, the increased chances of technological damage from solar storms. For those saying that there is nothing new under the sun, including these storms, things like the Carrington event superstorm are rare enough that we have not been vulnerable to such an electromagnetic event very long. Definitely not long enough to witness the worst they can be. When NASA says there could be two trillion worth of damage from a mega CME, I think they're being optimistic, especially with our weak shield. And with the collapsing atmosphere, this combined situation could get ugly for the weather. Fast. I do not think the world is going to come to an end this December. If you are willing to hear what the world and even our experts are telling you here, and you are willing to prepare, I do not think you have anything to fear. But this is not something to ignore. And while doomsday may not be on our doorstep, this situation does seem to be getting worse. The consequences of our ignorance are a bit beyond my willingness to entertain atrocity. All the links are below in the description box, along with how discourse surrounding both Harp and Nibiru fits into this puzzle. Eyes open. Be safe, everyone.